Chapter 10 Walking the Black Road We stayed in that country near the Bighorn Mountains for about a moon, maybe a little more. My father told me all the fighting had not done any good, because the hang around the fort people were getting ready to sell the Black Hills to the Wasichu anyway, and that more soldiers were coming to fight us. He said that Three Stars was on Goose Creek, and that many other soldiers were up on the Yellowstone, and that these would come together and have us between them. Some of our people had been leaving us, a few at a time, and going in to live at the agencies the Wasichus had made. But there were many of us left, and so we started with all our ponies to get away from the soldiers. We traveled in a very long line down the rosebud and camped where the river flows through between high bluffs. Then we moved on downstream to where we had the big sun dance before the rubbing out of long hair. The soldiers had come through that way, and the holy place was all cut up with shod hoofs and made dirty with horse droppings. Then we moved on downstream to a sacred place where there is a big rock bluff right beside the water, and high up on this bluff pictures used to appear, foretelling something important that was going to happen soon. There was a picture on it then, of many soldiers hanging head downward, and the people said it was there before the rubbing out of long hair. I do not know, but it was there then, and it did not seem that anybody could get up that high to make a picture. We moved over to the Tongue River and camped a little while. When we were there, scouts came in and said that a big fireboat had come up the Yellowstone with a load of corn for the soldiers' horses, and that it was piled on the other side of the river. Some of our young men went to sea, and one of them, Yellow Shirt, got killed by the fireboat's soldiers over there. But the others brought corn home and they gave us some. We parched it and it was good. About this time in the moon of black cherries, August, the scattering of the people began, because by now we learned that the soldiers were coming again. Dull Knife and the Shailas went over to Willow Creek in the Bighorn Mountains. Many of the Lakotas stole away in small parties and started for the agencies. The rest of us, still a great many, started east, and the soldiers of three stars followed us. Our people set fire to the grass behind us as we went, and the smoke back there was wide as the day, and the light of the fire was wide as the night. This was to make the soldiers' horses starve. Then it began to rain, and it kept on raining for days while we traveled east. Our ponies had to work hard in the deep mud, and it must have been bad for the soldiers' horses back there with nothing to eat. Sitting Bull and Gall with some people left us and started for Grandmother's land, Canada, and other people were going away from us all the time, but Crazy Horse would not leave the country that was ours. In the moon of the Black Calf, September, we were camping near the head of the Grand River when American Horse with many teepees had a fight with the soldiers of Three Stars by the Slim Buttes on Rabbit Creek. They fought hard there in the rain, and the soldiers killed American horse and chased the women and children out of their homes and took all the papa, dried bison meat, that they had made to feed themselves that winter. Then Crazy Horse went over there with a band of our warriors and chased the soldiers through the rain. They fled southward toward the Black Hills, and many of their horses died in the deep mud. He followed them a long way and made them fight as they fled. Wherever we went, the soldiers came to kill us, and it was all our own country. It was ours already when the Wasichus made the treaty with Red Cloud. That said it would be ours as long as grass should grow and water flow. That was only eight winters before, and they were chasing us now because we remembered and they forgot. After that we started west again, and we were not happy any more, because so many of our people had untied their horses' tails and gone over to the Wasichus. We went back deep into our country, and most of the land was black from the fire, and the bison had gone away. We camped on the Tongue River where there was some cottonwood for the ponies, and a hard winter came on early. It snowed much, game was hard to find, and it was a hungry time for us. Ponies died, and we ate them. They died because the snow froze hard, and they could not find the grass that was left in the valleys, and there was not enough cottonwood to feed them all. There had been thousands of us together that summer, but there were not two thousand now.
News came to us there in the moon of the falling leaves, November, that the Black Hills had been sold to the Wasichus and also all the country west of the hills, the country we were in then. I learned when I was younger that our people did not want to do this. The Wasichus went to some of the chiefs alone and got them to put their marks on the treaty. Maybe some of them did this when they were crazy from drinking the Mine Wakan, holy water, whiskey. The Wasichus gave them. I have heard this, I do not know. But only crazy or very foolish men would sell their mother earth. Sometimes I think it might have been better if we had stayed together and made them kill us all. Dull Knife was camping with his band of Shailas on Willow Creek in the edge of the Bighorn Mountains, and one morning, very early, near the end of the moon of falling leaves, the soldiers came there to kill them. The people were all sleeping, the snow was deep, and it was very cold. When the soldiers began shooting into the teepees, the people ran out into the snow, and most of them were naked from their sleeping robes. Men fought in the snow and cold with nothing on them but their cartridge belts, and it was a hard fight, because the warriors thought of the women and children freezing. They could not whip the soldiers, but those who were not killed and did not die from the cold got away and came to our camp on the tongue. I can remember when Dull Knife came with what was left of his starving and freezing people. They had almost nothing, and some of them had died on the way. Many little babies died. We could give them clothing, but of food we could not give them much, for we were eating ponies when they died. And after a while, they left us and started for the soldier's town on White River to surrender to the Wasichus, and so we were all alone there in that country that was ours and had been stolen from us. After that, the people noticed that Crazy Horse was queerer than ever. He hardly ever stayed in the camp. People would find him out alone in the cold, and they would ask him to come home with them. He would not come, but sometimes he would tell the people what to do. People wondered if he ate anything at all. Once my father found him out alone like that, and he said to my father, Uncle, you have noticed me the way I act, but do not worry. There are caves and holes for me to live in, and out here the spirits may help me. I am making plans for the good of my people. He was always a queer man, but that winter he was queerer than ever. Maybe he had seen that he would soon be dead and was thinking how to help us when he would not be with us any more. It was a very bad winter for us, and we were all sad. Then another trouble came. We had sent out scouts to learn where the soldiers were, and they were camping at the mouth of the tongue. Early in the moon of frost in the teepee, January, some of our scouts came in and said that the soldiers were coming up the tongue to fight us, and that they had two wagon guns, cannon, with them. There was no better place to go, so we got ready to fight them, and I was afraid, because my father told me we had not much ammunition left. We moved the village a little way off upstream, and our warriors were ready on a high bluff when the walking soldiers and their wagons came in the morning. The soldiers built fires and ate their breakfast there in the valley while our people watched them and were hungry. Then they began shooting with the wagon guns that shot twice, because the iron balls went off after they fell. Some of them did not go off, and we boys ran after one of these and got it. Then the walking soldiers started up the bluff, and it began to snow hard, and they fought in the blizzard. We could not stop the soldiers coming up, because we had not much ammunition. The soldiers had everything, but our men used spears and guns for clubs when the soldiers got there, and they fought hand to hand a while, holding the soldiers back until the women could break camp and get away with the children and ponies. We fled in the blizzard southward up the tongue and over to the Little Powder River. The soldiers followed us a while, and there was fighting in our rear. We got away, but we lost many things we needed, and when we camped on the Little Powder, we were almost as poor as Dull Knife's people were the day they came to us. It was so cold that the sun made himself fires, and we were eating our starving ponies. Late in the moon of the dark red calf, February, or early in the moon of the snow blind, March, Spotted Tail, the Brule, with some others, came to us. His sister was Crazy Horse's mother. He was a great chief and a great warrior before he went over to the Wasichus. I saw him and I did not like him. He was fat with Wasichu food and we were lean with famine. My father told me that he came to make his nephew surrender to the soldiers because our own people had turned against us 
and in the spring when the grass was high enough for the horses, many soldiers would come and fight us, and many Shoshones and Crows and even Lakotas and our old friends the Shailas would come against us with the Wasichus. I could not understand this, and I thought much about it. How could men get fat by being bad, and starve by being good? I thought and thought about my vision, and it made me very sad, for I wondered if maybe it was only a queer dream after all. And then I heard that we would all go into the soldier's town when the grass should appear, and that Crazy Horse had untied his pony's tail and would not fight again. In the moon of the grass appearing, April, our little band started for the soldier's town ahead of the others, and it was early in the moon when the ponies shed, May, that Crazy Horse came in with the rest of our people and the ponies that were only skin and bones. There were soldiers and Lakota policemen in lines all around him when he surrendered there at the soldier's town. I saw him take off his war bonnet. I was not near enough to hear what he said. He did not talk loud, and he said only a few words, and then he sat down. I was fourteen years old. We had enough to eat now, and we boys could play without being afraid of anything. Soldiers watched us, and sometimes my father and mother talked about our people who had gone to grandmother's land with Sitting Bull and Gull, and they wanted to be there. We were camped near Red Cloud's agency, which was close to the soldier's town. What happened that summer is not a story. Chapter 11. The Killing of Crazy Horse one night early in the moon when the calf grows hair, September, we broke camp there at Red Cloud Agency without making any noise and started. My father told me we were going to Spotted Tail's camp, but he did not tell me why until later. We traveled most of the night and then we camped. But when we were moving again the next day, a band of Red Cloud's people overtook us and said there would be bad trouble if we did not come back right away. Some of us turned around then and went back, and soldiers sent the others back a little later, but Crazy Horse went on to his uncle's camp. After what happened, my father told me why Crazy Horse had done this. He was afraid somebody might start trouble down there, where all the soldiers were, and the Wasichus had taken our guns away from us, so that we could do nothing if there was bad trouble. The Wasichus had made Spotted Tail head chief of all the Lakotas because he would do what they wanted, and Crazy Horse thought we might be safer there with his uncle. Afterwards, the hang around the fort people said that he was getting ready to tie up his horse's tail again and make war on the Wasichus. How could he do that when he had no guns and could not get any? It was a story the Wasichus told, and their tongues were forked when they told it. Our people believe they did what they did because he was a great man, and they could not kill him in battle, and he would not make himself over into a Wasichu, as Spotted Tail and the others did. That summer, my father told me, the Wasichus wanted him to go to Washington with Red Cloud and Spotted Tail and others to see the great father there, but he would not go. He told them that he did not need to go looking for his great father. He said, My father is with me, and there is no great father between me and the great spirit. In the evening of the next day, after we got back to Red Cloud's agency, some soldiers came there bringing Crazy Horse with them. He was riding his horse alone a little way ahead. They did not stay there long, but rode on over to the soldier's town, and my father and I went along with many others to see what they were going to do. When we got over there, we could not see Crazy Horse, because there were soldiers and Lakota policemen all around where he was and people crowding outside. In just a little while, I could feel that something very bad was happening in there, and everybody was excited all at once, and you could hear voices buzzing all around. Then I heard a loud cry in our own language, and it said, Don't touch me, I am Crazy Horse, and suddenly something went through all the people there like a big wind that strikes many trees all at once. Somebody in there yelled something else, but everybody around me was asking or telling everybody what had happened, and I heard that Crazy Horse was killed, that he was sick, that he was hurt, and I was frightened, because everything felt the way it did that day when we were going up to kill on the greasy grass, and it seemed we might all begin fighting right away. Then everything got quiet, and everybody seemed to be waiting for something. Then the people began to break up and move around, and I heard that Crazy Horse had just taken sick, and maybe he would be all right soon. But it was not long until we all knew what had happened in there, because some of the people saw it happen, 
and I will tell you how it was. They told Crazy Horse they would not harm him if he would go to the soldier's town and have a talk with the Wasichu chief there. But they lied. They did not take him to the chief for a talk. They took him to the little prison with iron bars on the windows, for they had planned to get rid of him. And when he saw what they were doing, he turned around and took a knife out of his robe and started out against all those soldiers. Then Little Big Man, who had been his friend and was the one who told us boys that we were brave before my first fight when we attacked the wagons on War Bonnet Creek, took hold of Crazy Horse from behind and tried to get the knife away. And while they were struggling, a soldier ran a bayonet into Crazy Horse from one side at the back, and he fell down and began to die. Then they picked him up and carried him into the soldier chief's office. The soldiers stood all around there and would not let anybody in and made the people go away. My father and I went back to our camp at Red Cloud Agency. That night I heard mourning somewhere, and then there was more and more mourning until it was all over the camp. Crazy Horse was dead. He was brave and good and wise. He never wanted anything but to save his people, and he fought the Wasichus only when they came to kill us in our own country. He was only thirty years old. They could not kill him in battle. They had to lie to him and kill him that way. I cried all night, and so did my father. When it was day, Crazy Horse's father and mother brought him over to our camp in a wagon. They put him in a box, and I heard that they had to cut him in two because the box was not long enough. They fastened the box on a pony drag and went away alone toward the east and north. I saw the two old people going away alone with their son's body. Nobody followed them. They went all alone, and I can see them going yet. The horse that pulled the pony drag was a buckskin. Crazy Horse's father had a white-faced bay with white hind legs. His mother had a brown mare with a bay colt. The old people never would tell where they took the body of their son. Nobody knows today where he lies, for the old people are dead too. Many have talked about the place, and some have said they knew where it was and would not tell, and many think it is somewhere on Bear Creek in the Badlands. I know one thing, and this is it. The old people came with the body right down Pepper Creek, which is just a little way south across the hill from where we are. There were two hunters who were hunting along the creek there, and they saw two old people coming with a pony drag, and when they told my father about this, they said a buckskin was pulling the drag that had a box on it, that the old man rode a white-faced bay with white hind legs and the old woman rode a brown mare with a bay colt. These hunters saw the old people coming down Pepper Creek, and later on they saw the old people again on White Horse Creek, which is just a little way down Pepper Creek from where they were before. And the hunters said the box was not on the drag anymore. So I think that maybe they hid the body somewhere on Pepper Creek over there because the hunters had seen them, and maybe they went back again at night and took the box away into the Badlands. But Crazy Horse might be lying over there just a little way from us right now on Pepper Creek across that hill yonder. I do not know. It does not matter where his body lies, for it is grass, but where his spirit is, it will be good to be. Chapter 12 Grandmother's Land at the end of the moon of falling leaves, October, after they had killed Crazy Horse, the Wasichus told us we must move from where we were over to the Missouri River and live there at different agencies they had made for us. One big band started with Red Cloud, and we started with another big band under Spotted Tail. These two bands were about a day's travel apart. Our people were all sad because Crazy Horse was dead, and now they were going to pen us up in little islands and make us be like Wasichus. So before we had gone very far, some of us broke away and started for the country where we used to be happy. We traveled fast, and the soldiers did not follow us. But when our little band came to the Powder River country, it was not like it used to be, and we were not ready for the winter, so we kept on traveling north. And we went fast, because we wanted to be with our relatives under Sitting Bull and Gull in Grandmother's Land. It was very cold before we reached Clay Creek, where our relatives were, but they were glad to see us and took care of us. They had made plenty of meat, for there were many bison in that country, and it was a good winter. The soldiers could not come to kill us there. 
I was fifteen years old that winter, and I thought much of my vision and wondered when my duty was to come, for the grandfathers had shown me my people walking on the black road and how the nation's hoop would be broken and the flowering tree be withered before I should bring the hoop together with the power that was given to me and make the holy tree to flower in the center and find the red road again. Part of this had happened already, and I wondered when my power would grow so that the rest might be as I had seen it in my vision. But I could say nothing about this to anyone, because I was only a boy and people would think I was foolish and say, what can you do if even sitting bull can do nothing? When the grasses appeared again, we went bison hunting, and I was big enough now to hunt with the men. My uncle, Running Horse, and I were out together alone one day. I was riding a bay and leading my roan, which was very fast. My uncle was riding a roan and leading a brown horse. We came to Little River Creek and crossed it, and just then I began feeling queer, and I knew something was going to happen. So I said to my uncle, I have a queer feeling and I think something is going to happen soon. I will watch while you kill a bison and we will make quick work of it and go. He looked at me in a strange way a while. Then he said, how, and started after a bison. There were several grazing in the valley. I held my horses and watched. When he had killed a fat cow, I went to help him butcher, but I held my horses while I was doing this, for I still had the queer feeling. Then I heard a voice that said, go at once and look. I told Running Horse I would go to the top of the hill and see what was there. So I rode up and I saw two Lakota hunters galloping after a bison across a valley towards some bluffs. Just after they went out of sight behind a bluff, my horse began to prick up his ears and look around and sniff the air. Then I heard some fast shooting over there, then many horses' hoofs. Then I saw a band of about fifty horsebacks coming out from behind the bluff where the two hunters had disappeared. They were crows, and afterwards we learned that they had killed the two hunters. So my uncle and I took as much meat as we could and rode fast back to our village and told the others. This showed that my power was growing, and I was glad. In the moon of making fat, June, Sitting Bull and Gall had a sun dance at Forest Butte, and afterwards we went hunting again. A man by the name of Iron Tail was with me this time, and we were out alone. I killed a big fat bison cow and we were butchering, when a thunderstorm was coming up. Then it began to pour rain, and I heard a voice in the clouds that said, Make haste, before the day is out something will happen. Of course, when I heard this, I was excited and told Iron Tail I had heard a voice in the clouds and that we must hurry up and go. We left everything but the fat of the cow and fled. When we got to the camp of our little band, we were excited and told the people we must flee, so they broke camp and started. We came to Muddy Creek. It was still raining hard and we had trouble getting across because the horses sank in the mud. A part of us got across, but there was an old man with an old woman and a beautiful daughter whose pony drag got stuck in the middle of the creek. Just then a big band of crows came charging, and there were so many of them that we could not hold them off and we had to flee, shooting back at them as they came after us. There was a man called Brave Wolf who did a very great deed there by the ford that day. He was close to the pony drag of the two old people and the beautiful girl when it got stuck in the mud. So he jumped off his horse, which was a very fast bison runner, and made the beautiful girl get on. Then he stood there by the two old people and fought until all three were killed. The girl got away on his fast horse. My cousin, hard to hit, did a brave deed too, and died. He charged back alone at a crow who was shooting at a Lakota in a bush, and he was killed. The voice in the clouds had told the truth and it seemed that my power was growing stronger all the time. When my cousin, hard to hit, was killed, it was my duty to protect his wife, so I did, and we got lost from our little party in the dark. It rained all night, and my cousin's wife cried so hard that I had to make her quit for fear some enemy might hear her and find us. When we reached the big camp in the morning, my relatives began mourning for my cousin, hard to hit. They would put their arm across each other's shoulders and wail. They did this all day long, and I had to do it too. I went around crying, hown, hown, and saying over and over, my cousin, he thought so much of me, and I thought so much of him, and now he is dead, hown, hown. 
I liked my cousin well enough, but I did not feel like crying all day. This was what I had to do, and it was hard work. We stayed on Clay Creek in Grandmother's Land all that summer and the next winter when I was 16 years old. That was a very cold winter. There were many blizzards. Game was hard to find, and after a while the papa, dried meat, that we had made in the summer was all eaten. It looked as though we might starve to death if we did not find some game soon, and everybody was downhearted. Little hunting parties went out in different directions, but it is bad hunting in blizzard weather. My father and I started out alone, leading our horses in the deep snow. When we got to Little River Creek, we made a shelter with our bison robes against a bank of the stream and started a fire. That evening, I saw a rabbit in a hollow tree, and when I chopped the tree down, there were four rabbits in there. I killed them all, because the snow was so deep they could not get away. My father and I roasted them, and we ate all four of them before we went to sleep, because it was hard walking in the snow, and we had been empty a good while. The wind went down that night, and it was still very cold. While I was lying there in a bison robe, a coyote began to howl not far off and suddenly I knew it was saying something. It was not making words, but it said something plainer than words, and this was it. Two-legged one, on the big ridge west of you there are bison, but first you shall see two more two-leggeds over there. My father had dozed off, so I wakened him and said, Father, I have heard a coyote say that there are bison on the big ridge west of us, and that we shall first see two people over there. Let us get up early. By this time, my father had noticed that I had some kind of queer power, and he believed me. The wind came up again with the daylight, and we could see only a little way ahead when we started west in the morning. Before we came to the ridge, we saw two horses, dim in the blowing snow beside some bushes. They were huddled up with their tails to the wind and their heads hanging low. When we came closer, there was a bison robe shelter in the brush, and in it were an old man and a boy, very cold and hungry and discouraged. They were Lakotas and were glad to see us, but they were feeling weak because they had been out two days and had seen nothing but snow. We camped there with them in the brush, and when we went up on the ridge afoot, there was much timber up there. We got behind the hill in a sheltered place and waited, but we could see nothing. While we were waiting, we talked about the people starving at home, and we were all sad. Now and then the snow haze would open up for a little bit and you could see quite a distance. Then it would close again. While we were talking about our hungry people, suddenly the snow haze opened a little, and we saw a shaggy bull's head coming out of the blowing snow up the draw that led past us below. Then seven more appeared, and the snow haze came back and shut us in there. They could not see us, and they were drifting with the wind so that they could not smell us. We four stood up and made vows to the four quarters of the world, saying, Ha ho, ha ho. Then we got our horses from the brush on the other side of the ridge and came around to the mouth of the draw where the bison would pass as they drifted with the wind. The two old men were to shoot first, and then we two boys would follow the other's horse back. Soon we saw the bison coming. The old people crept up and shot, but they were so cold and maybe excited that they got only one bison. They cried, Hoka, and we boys charged after the other bison. The snow was blowing hard in the wind that sucked down the draw, and when we came near them, the bison were so excited that they backtracked and charged right past us bellowing. This broke the deep snow for our horses, and it was easier to catch them. Suddenly I saw the bison I was chasing go out in a big flurry of snow, and I knew they had plunged into a snow-filled gulch, but it was too late to stop, and my horse plunged right in after them. There we were all together, four bison, my horse, and I all floundering and kicking, but I managed to crawl out a little way. I had a repeating rifle that they gave me back at the camp, and I killed the four bison right there, but I had thrown my mittens away, and the gun froze to my hands while I was shooting, so that I had to tear the skin to get it loose. When I went back to the others, the other boy had killed three, so we had eight bison scattered around there in the snow. It was still morning, but it took till nearly dark for my father and the other old man to do the butchering. 
I could not help because my hands were frozen. We finally got the meat all piled up in one place, and then we made a camp in a fine shelter behind a big rock with brush all around it and plenty of wood. We had a big fire, and we tied our tanned robes on our horses and fed them plenty of cottonwood bark from the woods by the stream. The raw robes we used for the shelter. Then we had a big feast, and we sang and were very happy. The wind went down, and it grew very cold, so we had to keep the fire going all night. During the night, I heard a whimpering outside the shelter, and when I looked, there was a party of porcupines huddled up as close as they thought they dared to be, and they were crying because they were so cold. We did not chase them away, because we felt sorry for them. We started afoot for camp next day with as much meat loaded on the horses as they could carry. The rest of it we cached by a big tree where it would be easy to find. We traveled all that day very slowly because the snow was deep, and all the while it seemed to be growing colder. At about sundown of the second day we reached camp, and the people were glad to see us with all the meat. Some other men went back later to bring in the meat we had cached. The morning after we reached home, I went out to look for our horses that were in a draw where there was cottonwood, and five of them had frozen to death. The cold was very bad after the wind stopped blowing. We began to feel homesick for our own country where we used to be happy. The old people talked much about it and the good days before the trouble came. Sometimes I felt like crying when they did that. Chapter 13 The Compelling Fear when the grasses were showing their tender faces again, two families of us started for our own country where we used to be happy. We had only five horses among us, because all the others had died in the cold, and we traveled on foot. It was a very rainy time. After a while, we came to All Gone Tree Creek. We came there in the afternoon and camped, and I thought I would take horses out to eat where the grass was good. But when I had gone only a little way, all of a sudden the queer feeling came again, and I heard a voice that said, Be careful and watch, something you shall see. The voice was so clear that I looked around to see who was there, and nobody was there. So I staked the horses right there not far from the camp, and sat down to think about it. There was a tall bluff a little way from the camp, and it had two points on it. So I went over there and climbed to one of the tops where there were some big rocks scattered around. I lay down in those rocks and looked all around, but I could see nothing, and I began to wonder if I was only queer in thinking I had heard a voice. Then I looked over to the other point of the bluff not far away, and there were two men crawling up toward the top on their bellies. I knew they were enemies, and I thought they were crows, but later I learned that they were Blackfeet. I lay as flat as I could and peeped around a rock at the two men. They were so near that I could have thrown a rock over there, and I thought if I only had my gun, I could kill them both. They stopped near the top, and one crawled a little farther and peeped over at our teepees in the valley where the women were having a hard time to get the fire started with wet wood. Then the first one motioned to the second, and they both looked over. I could hear them talking now, and I knew they were planning how to attack us. After a little while, they crawled down backwards a short way, then got up and ran downhill and disappeared. When they were gone, I crawled to the other side of the bluff and went down. When I reached the bottom, I sat down and thought of my vision and began to pray to the spirits. I said, Grandfathers, something may happen to me, but I will depend on the power you have given me. Hear me and help me. Then I ran over to our teepees and told the people we must flee at once, because I had seen enemies planning to attack. We were so small a party that we did not dare wait to take our teepees down, so we started right away and traveled very fast. We had to cross All Gone Tree Creek, and it was bankful and roaring with the big rains. So two of us boys swam across with rawhide ropes, which the old women fastened around them under their arms, and we pulled them across through the deep water. They nearly drowned before we could drag them out, because the water was swift. Our horses swam across, and we went fast, with the old people on the horses. As we fled east, a thundercloud came from the west behind us, and I knew it was coming to protect us. I could hear the thunder beings crying, hey, hey, to me. 
The clouds stood over us and did not rain much, but it was full of lightning and of voices. We had not gone so very far, and it was growing dark, when we heard shooting behind us in the direction of our deserted camp, and we thought the enemies were shooting into the teepees, thinking that we might be in there yet. It grew very dark, for the thundercloud with the many voices hung over us, and we traveled fast all night. Then after a while the cloud broke, and it was daybreak. We camped to eat and sleep. I knew better than ever now that I really had power, for I had prayed for help from the grandfathers, and they had heard me and sent the thunder beings to hide us and watch over us while we fled. When we had eaten and slept, we started again and came to a camp of Minikunjus. After that, we traveled with our relatives to the mouth of the Poplar River and crossed over the Missouri on a fireboat that was there. Then after we had hunted a while, we went to the soldier's town at the mouth of Tongue River and camped there with others of our people who had wandered away from the reservations into our old country. The soldiers took our guns away from us and most of our horses, leaving us only two horses for every teepee. There in the moon of making fat we had a sun dance, and after this it seemed I could think of nothing but my vision. I was sixteen years old and more, and I had not yet done anything the grandfathers wanted me to do. But they had been helping me. I did not know how to do what they wanted me to do. A terrible time began for me then, and I could not tell anybody, not even my father and mother. I was afraid to see a cloud coming up, and whenever one did, I could hear the thunder beings calling to me, Behold your grandfathers, make haste. I could understand the birds when they sang, and they were always saying, It is time, it is time. The crows in the day and the coyotes at night all called and called to me, It is time, it is time, it is time. Time to do what? I did not know. Whenever I awoke before daybreak and went out of the teepee because I was afraid of the stillness when everyone was sleeping, there were many low voices talking together in the east, and the daybreak star would sing this song in the silence. In a sacred manner you shall walk, your nation shall behold you. I could not get along with people now, and I would take my horse and go far out from camp alone and compare everything on the earth and in the sky with my vision. Crows would see me and shout to each other as though they were making fun of me. Behold him, behold him. When the frosts began, I was glad, because there would not be any more thunderstorms for a long while, and I was more and more afraid of them all the time, for always there would be the voices crying, ooh ooh he it is time, it is time. The fear was not so great all the while in the winter, but sometimes it was bad. Sometimes the crying of coyotes out in the cold made me so afraid that I would run out of one teepee into another, and I would do this until I was worn out and fell asleep. I wondered if maybe I was only crazy, and my father and mother worried a great deal about me. They said, it is the strange sickness he had that time when we gave the horse to Whirlwind Chaser for curing him, and he is not cured. I could not tell them what was the matter, for then they would only think I was queerer than ever. I was seventeen years old that winter. When the grasses were beginning to show their tender faces again, my father and mother asked an old medicine man by the name of Black Road to come over and see what he could do for me. Black Road was in a teepee all alone with me, and he asked me to tell him if I had seen something that troubled me. By now I was so afraid of being afraid of everything that I told him about my vision, and when I was through he looked long at me and said, Ah, ha, 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 meaning that he was much surprised. Then he said to me, Nephew, I know now what the trouble is. You must do what the bay horse in your vision wanted you to do. You must do your duty and perform this vision for your people upon earth. You must have the horse dance first for the people to see. Then the fear will leave you, but if you do not do this, something very bad will happen to you. So we began to get ready for the horse dance. Chapter 14 The Horse Dance there was a man by the name of Bear Sings, and he was very old and wise, so Black Road asked him to help, and he did. 
First, they sent a crier around in the morning who told the people to camp in a circle at a certain place a little way up the tongue from where the soldiers were. They did this, and in the middle of the circle, Bear Sings and Black Road set up a sacred teepee of bison hide, and on it they painted pictures from my vision. On the west side, they painted a bow and a cup of water. On the north, white geese and the herb. On the east, the daybreak star and the pipe. On the south, the flowering stick and the nation's hoop. Also, they painted horses, elk, and bison. Then, over the door of the sacred teepee, they painted the flaming rainbow. It took them all day to do this, and it was beautiful. They told me I must not eat anything until the horse dance was over, and I had to purify myself in a sweat lodge with a sage spread on the floor of it, and afterwards I had to wipe myself dry with sage. That evening, Black Road and Bear Sings told me to come to the painted teepee. We were in there alone, and nobody dared come near us to listen. They asked me if I had heard any songs in my vision, and if I had, I must teach the songs to them. So I sang to them all the songs that I had heard in my vision, and it took most of the night to teach these songs to them. While we were in there singing, we could hear low thunder rumbling all over the village outside, and we knew the thunder beings were glad and had come to help us. My father and mother had been helping too by hunting up all that we should need in the dance. The next morning they had everything ready. There were four black horses to represent the west, four white horses for the north, four sorrels for the east, four buckskins for the south. For all of these, young riders had been chosen. Also, there was a bay horse for me to ride, as in my vision. Four of the most beautiful maidens in the village were ready to take their part, and there were six very old men for the grandfathers. Now it was time to paint and dress for the dance. The four maidens and the sixteen horses all faced the sacred teepee. Black Road and Bear Sings then sang a song, and all the others sang along with them like this. Father, paint the earth on me. Father, paint the earth on me. Father, paint the earth on me. A nation I will make over. A two-legged nation I will make holy. Father, paint the earth on me. After that, the painting was done. The four black horse riders were painted all black with blue lightning stripes down their legs and arms and white hail spots on their hips. And there were blue streaks of lightning on the horse's legs. The white horse riders were painted all white with red streaks of lightning on their arms and legs and on the legs of the horses were streaks of red lightning and all the white riders wore plumes of white horse hair on their heads to look like geese. The riders of the sorrels of the east were painted all red with straight black lines of lightning on their limbs and across their breasts, and there was straight black lightning on the limbs and breasts of the horses, too. The riders of the buckskins of the south were painted all yellow and streaked with black lightning. The horses were black from the knees down, and black lightning streaks were on their upper legs and breasts. My bay horse had bright red streaks of lightning on his limbs, and on his back a spotted eagle, outstretching, was painted where I sat. I was painted red all over with black lightning on my limbs. I wore a black mask, and across my forehead a single eagle feather hung. When the horses and the men were painted, they looked beautiful, but they looked fearful, too. The men were naked, except for a breech clout. But the four maidens wore buckskin dresses dyed scarlet, and their faces were scarlet too. Their hair was braided, and they had wreaths of the sweet and cleansing sage, the sacred sage, around their heads, and from the wreath of each in front a single eagle feather hung. They were very beautiful to see. All this time I was in the sacred teepee with the six grandfathers, and the four sacred virgins were in there too. No one outside was to see me until the dance began. Right in the middle of the teepee, the grandfathers made a circle in the ground with a little trench, and across this they painted two roads, the red one running north and south, the black one east and west. On the west side of this, they placed a cup of water with a little bow and arrow laid across it, and on the east they painted the daybreak star. Then to the maiden, who would represent the north, they gave a healing herb to carry and a white goose wing, the cleansing wind. 
To her of the east they gave the holy pipe, to her of the south they gave the flowering stick, and to her who would represent the west they gave the nation's hoop. Thus the four maidens, good and beautiful, held in their hands the life of the nation. All I carried was a red stick to represent the sacred arrow, the power of the thunder beings of the west. We were now ready to begin the dance. The six grandfathers began to sing, announcing the riders of the different quarters. First they sang of the black horse riders like this. They will appear, may you behold them. They will appear, may you behold them. A horse nation will appear. A thunder being nation will appear. They will appear, behold. They will appear, behold. Then the black riders mounted their horses and stood four abreast facing the place where the sun goes down. Next, the six grandfathers sang, They will appear, may you behold them. A horse nation will appear, behold. A geese nation will appear, may you behold. Then the four white horsemen mounted and stood four abreast facing the place where the white giant lives. Next, the six grandfathers sang, where the sun shines continually, they will appear. A buffalo nation, they will appear. Behold, a horse nation, they will appear. May you behold. Then the red horsemen mounted and stood four abreast facing the east. Next to the grandfathers sang, Where you are always facing, an elk nation will appear. May you behold, a horse nation will appear. Behold. The four yellow riders mounted their buckskins and stood four abreast facing the south. Now it was time for me to go forth from the sacred teepee, but before I went forth I sang this song to the drums of the grandfathers. He will appear, may you behold him, an eagle for the eagle nation will appear, may you behold. While I was singing this in the sacred teepee I could hear my horse snorting and prancing outside. The virgins went forth four abreast, and I followed them, mounting my horse and standing behind them facing the west. Next, the six grandfathers came forth and stood abreast behind my bay, and they began to sing a rapid, lively song to the drums like this. They are dancing. They are coming to behold you. The horse nation of the west is dancing. They are coming to behold. Then they sang the same of the horses of the north and of the east and of the south. And as they sang of each troop in turn, it wheeled and came and took its place behind the grandfathers, the blacks, the whites, the sorrels, and the buckskins, standing four abreast and facing the west. They came prancing to the lively air of the grandfather's song, and they pranced as they stood in line. And all the while my bay was rearing too and prancing to the music of the sacred song. Now when we were all in line, facing the west, I looked up into a dark cloud that was coming there, and the people all became quiet, and the horses quit prancing. And when there was silence but for low thunder yonder, I sent a voice to the spirits of the cloud, holding forth my right hand, thus palm outward, as I cried four times, hey ya hey hey ya hey hey ya hey hey ya hey then the grandfathers behind me sang another sacred song from my vision, the one that goes like this. At the center of the earth, behold a four-legged. They have said this to me. And as they sang, a strange thing happened. My bay pricked up his ears and raised his tail and pawed the earth, neighing long and loud to where the sun goes down. And the four black horses raised their voices, neighing long and loud and the whites and the sorrels and the buckskins did the same, and all the other horses in the village neighed, and even those out grazing in the valley and on the hill slopes raised their heads and neighed together. Then suddenly, as I sat there looking at the cloud, I saw my vision yonder once again, the teepee built of cloud and sewed with lightning, the flaming rainbow door and underneath the six grandfathers sitting, and all the horses thronging in their quarters, and also there was I myself upon my bay before the teepee. I looked about me and could see that what we then were doing was like a shadow cast upon the earth from yonder vision in the heavens, so bright it was and clear. It knew the real was yonder, and the darkened dream of it was here. 
And as I looked, the six grandfathers yonder in the cloud, and all the riders of the horses, and even I myself upon the bay up there, all held their palms outward toward me. And when they did this, I had to pray, and so I cried, Grandfathers, you behold me, spirits of the world, you behold. What you have said to me, I am now performing. Hear me and help me. Then the vision went out, and the thunder cloud was coming on with lightning on its front and many voices in it, and the split-tail swallows swooped above us in a swarm. The people of the village ran to fasten down their teepees, while the black horse riders sang to the drums that rolled like thunder, and this is what they sang. I myself made them fear, myself I wore an eagle relic. I myself made them fear, myself a lightning power I wore. I myself made them fear, made them fear. The power of the hail I wore, I myself made them fear, made them fear. Behold me. And as they sang, the hail and rain were falling yonder just a little way from us, and we could see it. But the clouds stood there and flashed and thundered, and only a little sprinkle fell on us. The thunder beings were glad and had come in a great crowd to see the dance. Now the four virgins held high the sacred relics that they carried, the herb and the white wing, the sacred pipe, the flowering stick, the nation's hoop, offering these to the spirits of the West. Then people who were sick or sad came to the virgins, making scarlet offerings to them, and after they had done this, they all felt better and some were cured of sickness and began to dance for joy. Now the grandfathers beat their drums again, and the dance began. The four black horsemen, who had stood behind the grandfathers, went ahead of the virgins, riding toward the west side of the circled village, and all the others followed in their order while the horses pranced and reared. When the black horse troop had reached the western side, it wheeled around and fell to the rear behind the buckskins, and the white horse band came up and led until it reached the north side of the village. Then these fell back and took the rear behind the blacks, and the sorrels led until they reached the east. Then these fell back behind the whites, and the buckskins led until they reached the south. Then they fell back and took the rear so that the blacks were leading as before toward the western quarter that was theirs. Each time the leading horse troop reached its quarter, the six grandfathers sang of the powers of that quarter, and there my bay faced, pricking up his ears and neighing loud, till all the other horses raised their voices neighing. When I thus faced the north, I sent a voice again and said, Grandfather, behold me. What you gave me I have given to the people, the power of the healing herb and the cleansing wind. Thus my nation is made over. Hear and help me. And when we reached to the east, and after the grandfathers had sung, I sent a voice. Grandfather, behold me. My people, with difficulty they walk. Give them wisdom and guide them. Hear and help me. Between each quarter, as we marched and danced, we all sang together, a horse nation all over the universe, neighing they come, prancing they come, may you behold them. When we had reached the south and the grandfathers had sung of the power of growing, my horse faced yonder and neighed again, and all the horses raised their voices as before, and then I prayed with hand upraised, Grandfather, the flowering stick you gave me and the nation's sacred hoop I have given to the people, hear me, you who have the power to make grow, guide the people that they may be as blossoms on your holy tree, and make it flourish deep in Mother Earth, and make it full of leaves and singing birds. Then once more the blacks were leading, and as we marched and sang and danced toward the quarter of the west, the black hail cloud, still standing yonder, watching, filled with the voices crying, Hey, 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 hey! They were cheering and rejoicing that my work was being done, and all the people now were happy and rejoicing, sending voices back, hey, 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 and all the horses neighed, rejoicing with the spirits and the people. Four times we marched and danced around the circle of the village, singing as we went, the leaders changing at the quarters, the six grandfathers singing to the power of each quarter, and to each I sent a voice. 
and at each quarter as we stood somebody who was sick or sad would come with offerings to the virgins little scarlet bags of the chekun shasha the red willow bark and when the offering was made the giver would feel better and begin to dance with joy and on the second time around many of the people who had horses joined the dance with them milling round and round the six grandfathers and the virgins as we danced ahead and more and more got on their horses, milling round us as we went, until there was a whirl of prancing horses all about us at the end, and all the others danced a foot behind us, and everybody sang what we were singing. When we reached the quarter of the west the fourth time, we stopped in new formation, facing inward toward the sacred teepee in the center of the village. First stood the virgins, next I stood upon the bay, then came the six grandfathers with eight riders on either side of them, the sorrels and the buckskins on their right hand, the blacks and whites upon their left. And when we stood so, the oldest of the grandfathers, he who was the spirit of the sky, cried out, Let all the people be ready. He shall send a voice four times, and at the last voice you shall go forth and coop the sacred teepee, and who shall coop it first shall have new power." All the riders were eager for the charge, and even the horses seemed to understand and were rearing and trying to get away. Then I raised my hand and cried, hey, hey, four times, and at the fourth the riders all yelled, hoka, hey, and charged upon the teepee. My horse plunged inward along with all the others, but many were ahead of me and many cooped the teepee before I did. Then the horses were all rubbed down with sacred sage and led away, and we began going into the teepee to see what might have happened there while we were dancing. The grandfathers had sprinkled fresh soil on the nation's hoop that they had made in there with the red and black roads across it. And all around this little circle of the nation's hoop we saw the prints of tiny pony hoofs, as though the spirit horses had been dancing while we danced. Now Black Road who had helped me to perform the dance, took the sacred pipe from the Virgin of the East. After filling it with Chakun Shasha, the bark of the red willow, he lit and offered it to the powers of the world, sending a voice thus, Grandfathers, you where the sun goes, you of the sacred wind where the white giant lives, you where the day comes forth and the morning star, you where lives the power to grow, you of the sky and you of the earth, wings of the air and four leggeds of the world. Behold, I myself with my horse nation have done what I was to do on earth. To all of you I offer this pipe that my people may live. Then he smoked and passed the pipe. It went all over the village until everyone had smoked at least a puff. After the horse dance was over, it seemed that I was above the ground and did not touch it when I walked. I felt very happy, for I could see that my people were all happier. Many crowded around me and said that they or their relatives who had been feeling sick were well again, and these gave me many gifts. Even the horses seemed to be healthier and happier after the dance. The fear that was on me so long was gone, and when thunder clouds appeared I was always glad to see them, for they came as relatives now to visit me. Everything seemed good and beautiful now, and kind. Before this, the medicine men would not talk to me, but now they would come to me to talk about my vision. From that time on, I always got up very early to see the rising of the daybreak star. People knew that I did this, and many would get up to see it with me, and when it came we said, Behold the star of understanding, 